sentido. Good morning. I'm Kristen Duggleby, Director of Alumni Relations for the College of Law, and welcome you today to the College of Law's Law Alumni Weekend 2020, a virtual conference. Thank you for joining us for today's second annual Meet the Author. We are in webinar mode, which means that the audience can hear and see all of our panelists. But the audience is not on video. It is muted to prevent noise interference. 
but we welcome your questions. Please use the Q&A pod to send them along. We will monitor the board and include them in our discussion as much as possible. Also, please feel free to enter your questions on Whova. We will be monitoring those questions too. Please note that the chat feature has been disabled, except to convey universal guidance to all of you during the program. Please also know that we are recording our session. The recording will be available on the College of Law's website. We thank our CART reporter, Linda Frost, for her services today and our live captioning sponsor, the Lilatus Law Firm. Any member of our audience can view instantaneous translations of the spoken language during this program by clicking on the closed caption button at the bottom of your meeting window. Many thanks also to our other Law Alumni Weekend sponsor, Hancock and Estabrook. Now, to introduce today's program, we are joined by one of our distinguished alumni, the Honorable David F. Everett. Justice Everett graduated from the College of Law in 1976. He then practiced law in New York City for 36 years, the first 12 as an assistant district attorney in Queens and Brooklyn. He also served in the U.S. Army Reserve, eventually rising to the rank of colonel. In that capacity, he was deployed to Iraq in Operation Desert Storm. And after the attacks of September 11th, he was deployed to Afghanistan. In 2013, he was elected to the bench of Westchester County Court, and he currently serves on the New York State Supreme Court, Westchester County. It is my pleasure to hand the program over to Justice Everett. Good morning. Thank you, Kristen, for that introduction. And many thanks to all my fellow alumni for joining us today for what promises to be a very interesting conversation about one of the most important but least understood forms of emerging technology. As you heard, I graduated Syracuse in the class of 1976. I'm told we have representation in the audience today from alumni classes all the way back to 1962 and all the way up to last year's class, 2020. We also have some future alumni with us in the form of current students representing all three years of the JD program. So despite the necessary social distancing, I'm glad that we are still finding ways to show up and contribute to a sense of community for each other as Syracuse alumni across the generations. The author we'll be hearing from today is Judge Jamie Baker, director of the Syracuse University Institute for Security Policy and Law, or SPL, which many of the alumni here today might have known under its previous name, Institute for National Security and Counterterrorism, or INSCIT. The new name reflects the Institute's expanded focus since it was first founded to include security topics like cybersecurity, post-conflict reconstruction, and the subject of today's conversation, artificial intelligence. Judge Baker started his career as an infantry officer in the United States Marine Corps and subsequently joined the staff of Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan. From there, he went on to serve in the office of the legal advisor, U.S. State Department, as counsel of the President's Foreign Intelligence Advisory Board and Intelligence Oversight Board, and as special assistant to the President and legal advisor to the National Security Council. In 2000, he was appointed to the Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces, a civilian court which hears appeals from criminal prosecutions in the military justice system. He served on that court for 15 years, the last four as chief judge before stepping down in 2015. To lead the conversation with Judge Baker, we're lucky to have with us today, Professor Jamie Winders, Professor of Geography at the Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs and Director of SU's Autonomous Systems Policy Institute, or ASPI. ASPI is a campus-wide institute dedicated to interdisciplinary scholarship and teaching on the design, governance, and wider implications of autonomous systems and to critically engaging and shaping the policy and ethical frameworks that guide the use and development of autonomous systems. Professor Winders will be interviewing Judge Baker about his new book, The Centaur's Dilemma, National Security Law for the Coming AI Revolution. Please join me in welcoming Professor Winders and Judge Baker. Excellent. It worked. It worked, you can see both of us. Um, so my name is Jamie Winders, and I first want to say thanks to the organizers for inviting me to participate in this event. Um, I'm not a law professor, but I do park next to the law school, and so I like to think that that might count for, for something with my credentials. 
but it's a real treat uh, to get to talk with Judge Baker today about his new book, which I really um, enjoyed reading. And I think there are three strengths that really jumped out at me about the book that I'll share before we, we start talking more in it, about it in more depth. And I think the first is that uh, Judge Baker's book really shows how complicated and how urgent the need to understand AI's implications um, for national security are. And I think the book does that really well. The other thing I really appreciated about the book um, is that it really lays out this entanglement of law, ethics, policy, security, and technology, and why addressing this entanglement now before we're in a crisis situation is so important. And the third thing I really um, took from this book <clears throat> are the analogies and really potential templates for addressing the governance of AI um, that Judge Baker lays out, drawing from law and industry and academia and elsewhere. And I think it, one of the things that this book really um, embodies is why um, we need to begin from the embeddedness of AI in so many aspects of our daily lives, rather than trying to silo it in just one domain of influence. So I'm going to ask um, Judge Baker some questions about his book for about 30 minutes. And then we look forward to hearing from you and some of your questions about um, his book or some of the topics. Um, so my first question is, uh, why this book? Why this book? Why now? What was the motivation for writing it? And also, could you maybe explain, um, explain its title? Uh, thank you. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, thank you to Syracuse. I'd just like to start by noting uh, it, it's very handy at Syracuse that there's a requirement that everybody be named Jamie or Judge. Um, and so that helps for people like me who like simple topics like AI. Um, but uh, anyway, thank you. Uh, Jamie, thank you for reading the book as well. It appears that you're the other person who's read the book um, and uh, because you seem to have drawn out of it some of the things I hoped you would, uh, readers would get from the book. Um, but let me answer your question. Uh, why the book? Um, where did the book come from and why the title? Uh, I asked uh, Jason Matheny, who was the director of the Intelligence Advanced Research Project activity uh, in 2017 to come give a talk to a room full of national security lawyers, Washington national security lawyers. And he gave a, as Jason can only do, uh, he gave a brilliant talk about AI and emerging technologies. And at the end of it, he turned, I turned to him uh, and I said, Jason, uh, you're in a room full of lawyers. What is it we can do for you? And he said, what we need more than anything else in the field of AI and national security AI is for lawyers to look at the law and ethics of artificial intelligence because no one is doing that. And I said, well, I can be helpful with that. I can try and find a lawyer for you to do that. And, and we were in a room of 200 lawyers and I was thinking of someone uh, who knew computers and code and so on like that. And uh, so I, I went off and as is the case, I didn't do anything. And Jason called me back up two weeks later and I said, I found the person, I just want to run his name by you. Um, so I agreed to have coffee with him and we met and we, he didn't say who the name was. And I said, well, so who, who did you end up picking? And he said, I've picked you. Um, and I said, Jason, I can't even spell AI. Um, and he said, that's not what we're looking for. We know AI we need someone to look at the law and ethics. Um, so that's how I got roped into this project. Um, and then because I tend to be a, a serious person, um, I thought when he meant answer his question, he meant write a book. Because whenever you're asked a question, you need to write a book in response. Uh, so that's what this is. This is my response to Jason. Um, he's very careful now about how he asks me questions. Um, uh, the, so why the title? Uh, the the uh, Department of Defense, which um, as most people will know in, in this forum, uh, is sort of the leading edge of the government's effort in this area, in the artificial intelligence area. Not the leading edge in artificial intelligence, but certainly the leading edge in, in, uh, in the US government side of things. Um, uh, they refer to the Centaur model as being a model of AI application that is part machine, uh, part 
uh, AI, part, part, uh, uh, part human, so part human, part machine. Um, it turns out, in my view, that most of the ethical challenges, many of the ethical challenges with artificial intelligence present the dilemma, how much machine do you want and how much human do you want? So when we're talking about machines that might actually engage in targeting of humans, targeting of military targets, uh, generally people say we want more human. We want the human to make the decision. Uh, the machine can queue it up perhaps, but we want the, uh, we want the human uh, to, to make, the, make the call. When we're talking about cyber tools that uh, operate at machine speed, uh, they operate too fast for humans to, to make an actual decision. They have to put their input in earlier on in the nature of the code and the nature of what you permit the code to do or not to do. Um, so that's a different dilemma is in cyberspace, how do you operate at machine speed without losing human control? So everywhere we have AI applications, we have some form of this dilemma of how much machine, how much human, and which is which, and how do you have accountability in that context? Hence the Centaur's dilemma. Excellent. So we hear about AI a lot, but what we don't always hear are clear working definitions. So <laughs> for people who are maybe less familiar with this topic, what would be kind of a good starting definition or working definition for what artificial intelligence actually is? Um, that's a fair question. We didn't coordinate our questions ahead of time, by the way. So, so if there's some stumbles along the way, uh, fair enough. Um, I, when I started in on this project, um, I, I started, as lawyers like to do, I cataloged uh, the definitions and I was up in the high hundreds uh, when I realized I was getting nowhere because uh, there are so many different definitions. Um, but I, I think the definition um, I, I, I've, I've come back to and I like best is the one offered by the National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence which is that AI is a constellation of technologies that gives computers the capability to solve problems and perform human tasks that would ordinarily require human intelligence. So uh, here are some of the things I like about this definition. First, it's a constellation of technologies. It's not one technology, it's algorithms, it's data, it's uh, cloud computing, it's sensors. Um, and in each AI application and context, they come together in a different way uh, with different abilities and risks. And so I like that constellation of technologies. Think of it like more like electricity rather than a particular application of electricity, a lamp. Um, and then uh, solve problems and perform human tasks. Um, I'm less keen on the human tasks because this sends us down the robotic side of things. Um, and, and then naturally for people who aren't really in the field, it sends us into the world of science fiction and movies. Um, but it is true that uh, AI um, uh, allows machines to optimize what it is they're programmed to do and to do it at human level of uh, capability or better. Um, here are two definitions I like as much as, well, I don't, that's the definition I like, but the term I like, is, other than artificial intelligence, is human level machine intelligence, because it helps tell us that it's not human intelligence that's being performed here. It's human level machine intelligence. It's a different thing. It's a machine optimizing what it's been programmed to do. Um, I hope that's helpful. It may not be particularly helpful. Uh, one of my lessons and one of my takeaways, I hope from the book, and I hope in this, in this presentation, is when we look at AI, we should look at its individual component and applications, because the answer to what law and ethics should apply is going to be different for almost every AI application. It's not one size fits all. You got to see what, what is it you're doing, what is its capability, what is its risk, how are you going to use it? Now I'm going to apply my law and ethics, or I'm going to apply my law and ethics earlier on, but, but that's, I'm going to look at it in the, its particularities. Back to you, sorry. So given that kind of complexity of, of the definition of AI and all the different elements, um, and then given what you just said about we really need to think about these individual applications of AI, 
Um, it makes me think about the idea that you've already kind of referenced this notion of the human in the loop, humans in the loops, somehow back to that centaur's dilemma. So how does that complex, how do we think about that in relation to where AI does or maybe where AI should or shouldn't fit in kind of the idea of the chain of command and national security decisions? So another way to think about this is how does, what does AI change about how we do national security or how we think about national security? <laughs> small question, very small. Yeah, that's a small question. I, there's a number of places I can take, uh, take that. Uh, the, uh, so I'm gonna do three things here. Um, respond to your comment about humans in the loop, uh, on the loop or out of the loop. Um, talk about chain of command briefly nothing's brief in Jamie Baker land, but, but in my version of brief. And then uh, the big question there is how we think about national security. <laughs> That's a pretty broad, broad question. Um, so first, uh, the, the field uh, is stuck uh, in this concept of describing the centaur's dilemma as humans in the loop, on the loop, or out of the loop. Um, and that that's the current vernacular. I, I don't care for it um, because one, humans are always involved with AI. Someone has always written the code. Uh, someone always has always built the hardware, and someone has always attached both of those to something else. Uh, so there is a human, always a human in the loop, and therefore that means there can always be a human who is accountable uh, and who is responsible. So uh, in in Jamie Baker land. Uh, there is no such thing as a human out of the loop. Uh, but what that really means is the, the AI application is allowed to act autonomously uh, without a human making the final and affirmative decision uh, to either trade the stock, turn the electricity on or off, or fire the weapon. Um, so uh, one reason, another reason I'm not keen on the on the loop, in the loop, or out of the loop is because it's a continuum you can have an application where you're doing all three at once and at different points. And until we get away from these bromides about uh, generalizations about we need, we need AI that is uh, equitable or we need AI that is where humans are on the loop, we won't really solve the problem of what we mean with this AI application. Um, so I wanna move on to the next stage in, in how we as lawyers and we as practitioners look at the particular applications and get, go deeper than that. Uh, your, your next component of the question was chain of command and um, how does that affect how we make national security decisions? And uh, so this is, this, as, you, as you know, and as you suffer through, there's whole chapters in this book on this. So, so I'm not gonna now read a, do a dramatic reading of the chapters, um, but, but I would make uh, two essential points here. One, um, one of the dilemmas is the strength of AI is that, uh, that, that of most applications is that it uh, can operate at machine speed. It's instantaneous. And uh, so when you, when you bring in the human, uh, you, you automatically slow the process down and lose some of the advantages of the AI, if not all the advantages. So in national security land, um, the chain of command, whether it's the policy chain of command or the military chain of command, has to figure out where and how to operate at machine speed without losing control of outcomes. Uh, we, we have certain parallels where, where we've done this elsewhere in national security with pre-delegation. Uh, we've pre-delegated certain decisions or not. Uh, most of that is classified, but we've pre-delegated uh, certain concepts in national security practice. Uh, so we know how to do it. And the question is, when and how are we going to do that uh, with machines that operate at instantaneous speed? Um, the second point I would make, and there's a whole chapter in the book on this, which is, which is a key component of my ethical and legal response to AI, is from military law, we have the concept of command responsibility. Uh, commanders are always responsible for what their units do or don't do fail to do or, or uh, do uh, lawfully or unlawfully, uh, where they have reason to know. Um, so there's always going to be someone in a military construct who is ultimately responsible for how an AI has performed or not performed. 
um, and it is their duty to know how it will perform. So command responsibility posits that you're not only responsible for what you do or order that be done, but that you should be, uh, that you should know what's happening. This is the Yamashita principle. So what I'm suggesting in the book is that not only can we use that in the military context, not just for weapons, but also logistics and the more likely applications of AI, uh, but also we should adapt that principle and adopt it in the civilian context as well. We don't let the president off the hook because he's a, well, he's a civilian, um, or we don't let the uh, intelligence actor off the hook because they're a civilian, they're still having, they're still responsible in a command responsibility way for how that AI has performed or not performed. Um, that's not actual law right now, but I'm positing it as a construct by which we can bring that principle over to the world of AI to have some more accountability. I hope that's responsive. Yeah, that, that's great. I want it, so I want to come back to the point you began with, was this idea that in the loop is the wrong metaphor. I want to come back to some of the analogies you talk about. But another key theme that your book highlights is um, that in contrast to maybe thinking about the nuclear era or the nuclear issue, when we talk about AI, the private sector and industry are really leading the way in many regards. So how does that reality shape the way you think about the relationship between AI and law or AI and national security when it's not the, the government or the military that's really leading the charge here. Um, yeah, uh, fair point. So uh, in AI land, um, the vernacular that is used is the, uh, is the governance triangle or the organizational triangle. Uh, others simply say it's ungovernable. But, but the triangle is industry, academia, and government in that order. And, um, and uh, as, as anybody who, um, especially now during the era of COVID, we all know uh, uh, that, that our shopping is in many ways driven by algorithms. Um, and and that's, that's a pretty good example of how industry is leaving, leading the way. Um, one, of, one of the messages in the book uh, there's many messages, but one of the messages is um, when it comes to national security and when it comes to national policy, uh, not just in the security area, uh, on AI, uh, I believe as a matter of democratic principle, but also efficacy, uh, that uh, national security policy should not be made by Google, Microsoft, or Facebook, nor should it be made by the Department of Defense. It, be, it should be made by the constitutive elements of a, demo, of a democracy, which is the legislative branch and the executive branch uh, in a cohesive and thoughtful manner, um, by, the, by the way, which is not apparent is happening at this time. Um, and which is a comment about AI, not necessarily current events. Um, so, uh, so that means if we're going to um, respond to this, uh, in a in a cohesive, cohesive honorable way, uh, we need to not just regulate the government or address governmental uses, but also work across the board, uh, both with industry uh, and, and with academia. So that's why there is a chapter in the book, as you know, <laughs> uh, on um, corporate social responsibility and the levers the government can use to influence corporate behavior, um, as well as a chapter or section on academia ethics mm -hmm and regulation. Um, most governmental actors, as in probably all of them, um, don't really understand uh, how academia is regulated or not regulated. Um, uh, it's certainly those who haven't been in academia. And um, so that's why I added chapters in the book on that so that the general policy person and the general national security lawyer can read these and say, oh, this is how we might get our hands around that problem. Um, this, uh, so now I'm, I'm, I'm trapped myself into wanting to say everything at once. Um, the, uh, and now I've lost my chain of thought as well, but um, understanding the, the three key components, uh, industry, academia, um, and the government, um, obviously you need to work across all three. And so here's an example of doing that. The Department of Defense uh, not only set up an office in Silicon Valley, they also created this entity called the JAKE, uh, the Joint Artificial Intelligence Center, 
to be that component within DOD uh, to reach out to industry and academia and to build those relationships. And they focused on picking people to run that, not who were masters of code, uh, but who were masters at relationships, uh, because that's really what's necessary here is to build trust across these organizations. Um, and by the way, if we don't do that correctly, uh, think about um, the counterintelligence risks here. Uh, ac academics, <laughs> as, as uh, we well know, uh, do not look at questions like data security and counterintelligence uh, in the same way that governmental actors do. And sometimes that's a good thing, I suppose, if you're pursuing the edge of knowledge. But when data is, is the gold ore of AI machine learning, you can bet that if you have data in an academic setting, uh, it is being uh, vacuumed away even as we speak uh, if you have not applied gold standard security to it. Buy, buy data and you know where it will end up. I thought that was a really interesting point that you make about the idea of, of what would it mean to think about AI research and development in the context of industry and universities as a security risk of how, because the, the kind of leading edge of the technological development is, is not in government hands. Uh, so as I mentioned before, one of the things I found really interesting about your book is um, all the different templates or analogies that you offer for how we might think about AI governance. And it really resonates with a number of conversations that I've had with uh, many people about autonomous systems and kind of emerging technologies. And there's always this attempt to figure out what's the lens through which we should understand um, these new technologies. And so often when I talk about things like this, people will say, is, it, is that like that movie, Her? Is it like Jarvis and the Avengers? Oh, yeah. So there's always these cultural references, but you push this into the context of law um, and talk about you know, law by analogy or the idea that law is a search for metaphor. So could you talk a little bit about some of these analogies you discuss of nuclear and arms control and the law of armed conflict and what, what they do and don't show us about how AI um, governance and the relationship between AI and national security might play out. Uh, thank you. Uh, that's a good setup for something I hoped I'd have the opportunity to say. <laughs> uh, so uh, the, the book, um, if you don't mind, I'll take just a second on this one. Uh, the book is an effort to explain in plain English uh, to the national security specialists and the national security policy specialists um, what it is about AI they need to know. Uh, so this is, in theory, my effort. If I walked into the Oval Office and I was briefing and they gave me 17 hours, this is what I would say. Um, the, uh, uh, so the uh, first chapters are about what is AI, then the next chapter is about how, how might we use it and what are the implications and risks of that use. And then the rest of the book is about how we regulate it with law and ethics. Law serves three purposes, as our audience will know. Uh, it provides the authority to act in the boundaries of action. It provides essential process. And then it provides essential legal values, most and many of them embedded in the Constitution. What happens when there's no law on point? No law on point for AI, for example. Um, lawyers look to apply the law they have, whether it fits or not. Uh, so lawyers are going to apply the law they have. That means IEPA, the EPA, the Invention Secrecy Act, and so on. Uh, lawyers, uh, it elevates the importance of constitutional law because we always have constitutional law even if we have no statutory law on AI. And this means the First Amendment, the Fourth Amendment, the Fifth Amendment. Um, what also happens? Uh, it elevates the importance of litigation because when there's no regulatory regime, disputes are resolved through litigation, which is a terrible way to make national security policy. Look at the Apple uh, FBI dispute in San Bernardino in 2015. I don't want the FBI making national security policy any more than I want DOD. Horrible way uh, to make national security policy. And then the fourth thing that happens when there is no law on point is we look for law by analogy. Uh, and that's what we're doing here because there is no AI regime, there's no national security AI regime. So where can we find principles that might help us better use regulate and minimize uh, the risk. Um, and so I've looked in the book at uh, arms control principles uh, by analogy, the
the law of armed conflict by analogy. Um, and, and then uh, as, as we've already indicated, corporate social responsibility, academic ethics, and so on. Um, and here, uh, one needs to make sure they don't just go, oh, this looks nice, let's move this over to this. Um, instead, we're extracting the key principles uh, from the world of arms control uh, and applying it or adopting it, extracting the key principles from the law of armed conflict, one of which I just indicated, which was command responsibility. Uh, another key principle from the law of armed conflict is the duty to train on the law. Uh, and um, most, most, um, most civilians who come into national security policy positions have never been trained on the law of armed conflict. Um, and you learn that when, when you need to brief them for the first time, if you haven't done it already. Um, I posit that there ought to be a duty to educate and brief and understand AI before you use it, uh, for example, rather than just use it. Uh, what are its strengths and what are its limitations? Um, and then from the world of arms control, uh, we, get, we get some very interesting issues here, one of which is um, uh, from arms control, we learn how hard it is to verify uh, compliance, and um, especially in the area of biological weapons, but also uh, other areas as well. Um, obviously, in the area of AI, verification, confirmation that one is following the law is very complex. And so we, we did uh, at, at, at our institute, uh, there's a wonderful research fellow named Matt Middlestead, who for the first time, I, I couldn't believe there wasn't anything in the literature already, has looked at the question of how do you verify uh, compliance with AI law, regulation, principles, ethics? Uh, is it possible to do? And it turns out there are things you can do. It's not, it's not ideal. Uh, um, it's hard to determine when someone has done something with code. Uh, the Jamie Bakers of the world alone aren't going to look at a, a line of zeros and ones and figure out what's been jiggered um, or changed. But there are, in fact, ways of at least knowing that something's been changed. You may not know what it is. There's a lot of things you can do. Uh, so Matt's written the first, I think it's the first paper on the principles of verification extracted from arms control, but not applied mutatis mutandis. Uh, but applied in appropriate places. Um, so, uh, so blah, blah, blah. So that's, that, that's one of those things. Arms control, of course, the risk of saying arms control is it makes people think that AI is an arm. It's not. It's like electricity. It's a lot of things. It's that constellation of technologies. So you can't regulate it like you can regulate nuclear weapons. It's not a thing like that. But you can still extract principles. That's the point. Mm -hmm. Pew, was that was somewhat responsive? No, no, that was that was great. I was just I was really fascinated by um, by this role of analogies and metaphors because it it's present across all these different um, conversations around emerging technology, and it's really powerful. It shapes public opinion, um, and it, and it as we're seeing, it also is likely to shape kind of the legal framework for thinking about AI. So those of you who are, um, who are listening, if you have questions, I encourage you to post them in the Q&A and then I can, I can feed them to Judge Baker. But one of the things that I thought was interesting, and you get to this in chapter 10, where you, um, you, you make kind of an, you, you draw a potential parallel between COVID, which has become, which is a public health issue that has become deeply politicized and mapped on the political spectrum. And one of the things that is, I find very interesting about whether we're talking about autonomous systems or we're talking about AI is that in many ways, this is a topic that hasn't yet mapped onto the political spectrum. So in another part of my work, I study immigration and there is no aspect of immigration that doesn't map very clearly onto a, a conservative and a, a liberal or a Republican and a democratic um, spectrum. So immigration is deeply politicized in all sorts of ways. But some people have made the argument that emerging tech hasn't yet been fully politicized. So do you buy that argument? And if so, how long are we going to live in this kind of honeymoon period where this is a, this might be the one topic that hasn't yet been sort of fully politicized on the spectrum? <laughs> uh, you know, uh... So, 
Uh, care, careful what you ask for, right? If, if, <laughs> if one of the messages is we want more national, national policy and more law and ethics, uh, we don't want it with all the partisan nonsense that might come with it. And I take your point. Um, I, I think you're quite right. It has not gotten, uh, certainly it hasn't fallen into the trap of partisan politics, uh, but it, it, nor has it fallen into the national policy making trap either. Um, there are components that are looking at it with great care and doing a great job at it, but not in a uh, three-dimensional uh, sense of both industry, academia, government, and across whole of government. And of course, this is a whole of nation uh, issue AI is a whole of nation. It's not whole of government. It's not state federal. It is whole of nation, uh, which is a whole different kind of um, governance, law, and, and structural uh, dilemma. Um, so uh, I, I think generally it has not been uh, politicized, but the, the, the places where we will see it um, sort of the Venn diagram will overlap uh, for sure is in the whole area of corporate governance and corporate social responsibility because most people when they think of ai uh, either think of cultural references in movies you know uh and and super artificial intelligence and, and or they think of um social media platforms and all the risks of information operations and and all that kind of stuff and so it's hard to go into that space without getting into some form of partisan politics um, I started, uh, uh, one of the issues, of course, is are we, one of the risks uh, of, of AI, of the AI world, is that we're in a technology arms race. And arms race, again, is probably the wrong, arms race is a metaphor, it's not a descriptor, because it's not an arm, it's a technology, it's a constellation of technologies. But clearly, we're in some sort of a race with China. And so that means that emerging technologies become part of the China policy issue. And that, that can very quickly become uh, a, uh, uh, bring all the issues that China brings into the equation. Um, here's one point I would like very much to make. And so I'm gonna use this question to hijack, uh, to make the point I did not want to um, leave on the table at the end of the session. Um, and that is this, uh, China, Russia, Iran, many states, uh, some of our uh, least favorite and some of our more favorite uh, are all engaging in AI uh, research development and deployment in some ways and in different ways. Uh, it's here, it's coming. Uh, so the question is, how do we regulate it and, and whether we choose to do so, not, not can we hope it isn't gonna happen. Um, the key thing I think to this audience, and this audience is now all lawyers and all people who believe in ethics, uh, the thing that's gonna separate American AI and the American use of AI from the Chinese or Russian use of AI is not the AI, uh, but the law and ethics we apply to it. Mm -hmm. It's the principled application of AI, the principled application of facial recognition. Not don't use it, uh, but do you use it in an ethical manner? And there are ways to do that. And so if you're out there as a lawyer, um, you should get into this field because it's coming and you are the key actor. Uh, it, it, it's harder to find people who know how to apply ethics and law to AI than it is to find the person who knows how to apply code to AI. So that's one of the key takeaways here. Um, and uh, the book is a good place for you to start. Why is that? Because it's the worst book ever written on the topic, uh, because it's also the best, because at this time, it's the only one uh, that offers you an introductory primer to what you know to join this debate. Um, so again, it's the worst and the best. And I don't really care. I just want it to be out there so that it, so people have something to react to and pivot and move on to, into the debate from. So thank you for letting me make that pitch. So we have some, we've got some great questions from folks in the audience that I've been looking at. And so I have some other questions that I want to turn to some of theirs. And so one of the questions is that you speak about law, regulation, commercial industry, kind of industry versus government um, on this issue. Is there anything we can learn from international 
government regulation. So are there international kind of analogies, uh, presumably something like the UN or International Red Cross that might think about what you were just discussing, which is what happens to conversations about AI governance when we jump to kind of the global scale in multiple nation states? Uh, thank you. Um, the, the only thing I'll push back on in, in the question uh, is the government versus industry. Um, it feels like that sometimes, but um, one of the essential principles here is it, it, it's whole of government, uh, whole of nation, uh, and, and the question is positing whole of world. Um, and that requires partnership and relationships across these components, not adversarial relationships. Um, and, and though I understand they're often adversarial. So, so the goal is for us who are going to work in this field, and we've all committed to do so having attended this session, um, the, uh, is to build those relationships rather than create adversarial uh, uh, feelings. Um, the, uh, the, the answer is we should look for metaphor and analogy wherever, uh, wherever it is. Um, that's what lawyers do, by the way, when you look to find the case that the case law that is most applicable to your case, that's a search for metaphor, right? This is more like the Jones case than the Smith case. And the other side saying it's more like Smith than Jones. That's, uh, that's a search for metaphor. Uh, lawyers are very good at that. Um, and uh, so lawyers should look in the international world. I've looked at the OPCD, uh, OPC, uh, OPCW, which is the organization that oversees uh, and verifies the Chemical Weapons Convention. And it is uh, probably the most, well, certainly it's the most successful. So then you can debate how successful, but it's the most successful international mechanism uh, to verify a arms control regime. And it's doing it in a dual use area, which is always harder to do dual use, right? You can, it, there's no such thing as a dual use nuclear weapon. If you have a nuclear weapon, that's that. Uh, but most, all, virtually all chemicals uh, fall into a dual use capacity. You can mix them with something that makes them a weapon and therefore unlawful, or you can have chlorine that's used for scrubbing your floor or whatever. Um, so the OPCW is responsible for overseeing this regime uh, uh, verification. And it turns out, um, if you study it, that they do a lot of internal inspection. Uh, so most people wouldn't know that, that they go into um, Monsanto in St. Louis or outside of St. Louis, and they actually inspect the factory uh, to see if uh, the, the declarations that are made about what they're making are accurate and all these sorts of things. So, so that's an example of looking at an international organizational mechanism um, that might apply in this case. Uh, one, one, one of the challenges with looking to international law is, is it gets more... Uh, uh, generalized and, and diffuse, and it moves us further away from specific applications, because if it's the same law that's going to apply to, um, uh, you know, uh, Burkina Faso uh, as China, it's probably not going to necessarily be, um, uh, it, it falls into the one size fits all trap is I think what I'm trying to say. Um, one, there is a section in the book uh, by the way, on uh, lessons learned from the Ottawa Treaty. And the Ottawa Treaty is the landmine uh, treaty, uh, the anti-personnel landmine treaty. That's very important because uh, it, it, it only addresses a certain kind of landmine, which is a limitation. Um, but one reason the Ottawa Treaty, and I say this value neutral, uh, uh, there are arguments for or against it, particularly if you're the United States uh, and, and a global actor in, in the security field, or once a global actor in the security field. But, um, the, uh, but the Ottawa Treaty is an example where nations, other nations and other actors, non-governmental actors, I uh, think Princess Diana, for example, did not wait for the United, the key, usual key actors, the United States, China, Russia, uh, to, to join in or to buy in. Instead, they proceeded without them uh, to create a convention to regulate in some cases prohibit anti-personnel landmines. Um, and that's a model of, uh, of how other actors, uh, not the key actors like China, the government of China, the government of the United States, Google and so on. Uh, we don't need to wait for them to step into this space. Uh, those who believe in this can step into it now. Now we see a little bit of that with the killer robot debate at the UN. Um, 
don't spend your time on killer robots. Uh, I'll explain why in a second if you want to ask, but uh, AI is here and it's going to come here, not in the form of killer robots, uh, but in the form of logistic trains, shopping algorithms, search engines, intelligent search engines. These are the things we need to be focusing on right now. Uh, parole algorithms. Uh, and if we spend all our time worrying about super artificial intelligence and Fedor, the Russian robot that can shoot and carry large weights, um, we're going to miss what's going on over here and coming at us right now. So this, uh, another question from the audience is a perfect segue to what you just said. You talked a little bit about this idea of um, the parallel between AI and chemical weapons as dual use or dual threat. Um, and then you, you ended by highlighting all the other ways that AI might be incorporated um, into national security. So this question is, is AI only a national security issue because of self-operating weapon systems? What are some other applications of AI um, that relate to national security and maybe the pros and cons of all those other ways that we don't often think about when we, when we talk about AI and national security? Um. Thank you uh, to the person who asked that question. Uh, the, uh, so uh, for some, uh, the focus is on uh, weapons for some or autonomous weapons, uh, weapons that operate without human uh, decision and choice. Of course, the uh, militaries have had such weapons um, since the 1950s in one form or another, uh, but, but this, this is a different type of weapon uh, for the most part. Um, and uh, we also, people also think about um, uh, super artificial intelligence. And I, we can talk about that in a second if you'd like. What are some of the other areas where, where AI will appear in the national security space, already is in the national security space, and will appear sooner than in the area of weapons? Um, so uh, logistics, right? Logistics is one. Um, and think about planning D-Day. Uh, D-Day, uh, not with pieces of paper and cardboard cutouts where you load each of the uh, uh, vessels and each of the landing craft and figure out what will hit the shore and when and in which wave. Now you do it with an algorithm uh, based system uh, like um, Waze, like when you drive around and use one of those uh, land navigation things. Uh, but now you're doing all the logistics for D-Day or all the logistics for Desert Storm. Uh, which Judge Edward uh, honorably served uh, during, um, and the weather pattern change changes, or a, a coalition ally drops out, or brings three more tanks to the equation, um, you now can uh, do it all like that. Uh, you can queue up all the aircraft in a different manner, you can queue up all the vessels, you can figure out what comes by maritime, what comes by aircraft, and in what order. So that's logistics, that's here. Uh, they're talking about follow the leader logistics. Follow the leader logistics is where you have a human in the first vehicle and all the other vehicles behind are driven by algorithms uh, and, and follow the first vehicle. Now you get in trouble when the first vehicle gets hit uh, or the command vehicle, um, but that's, that's swarm technology, but not for swarm warfare, uh, but for logistics. That's coming if it's not already here. Um, so decision-making, um, remember that um, the some of the breakthrough uh, events in the area of artificial intelligence is when uh, the uh, a, an AI application uh, defeated a grandmaster in chess for the first time, uh, defeated uh, the world's leading player of the game Go, uh, which by the way, 60 million Chinese watched that live. So how many of you have watched live AI TV recently, right? This is something that is very much already in Chinese culture at a certain extent, to a certain extent, more than in our culture. But in any event, um, if you can do that, you can also model out and make predictions about human behavior, how the opponent will act if you do certain things. If you can figure out how the chess grandmaster might respond to a move, you can figure out you, it's a prediction. It's not an accurate prediction. It's a prediction. It's, it's, it's a guesstimate. Uh, you can model out how the opponent might uh, react to this move, your, this foreign policy move, or this military move. Um, so that's, that's an example where it might come into decision making. Um, intelligence is an obvious one. So what is AI good at right now, and what will it remain uh, very good at and get better at? It's good at pattern recognition, 
anomaly detection. But one thing everybody should know, and this, this you, you probably instantaneously grasp this. Uh, I, I didn't, it took me a moment to figure it out. AI, AI algorithms, the AI applications, most AI, AI applications are predictions, right? We tend to say, oh, the AI thing said blank. Uh, that doesn't mean blank is accurate. It's a prediction. Uh, and, and so think about that with driverless cars. Uh, they're ultimately predicting what they should do, not necessarily knowing what they should do. Uh, and so it depends on the strength of the algorithm. Here's a very concrete example of that with facial recognition. Uh, since 2011, uh, the FBI has conducted 390,000 uh, facial recognition searches uh, using its algorithm, facial recognition algorithm. So we talk about Chinese algorithms, FBI has them too. Uh, and um, uh, they've, they've looked through 460,000 facial images. Where did they find those facial images? Uh, driver's license databases from the states. In other words, your driver license picture has been part of these searches. Uh, and the, the algorithm GAO said, based on FBI looking at it, is 86% accurate in making a facial recognition match when the algorithm produces 50 possible matches. So it's not like in the movies where you do the input, the bank robber's picture, you go and Jason Bourne comes out the other side. There he is, right there in the train station. What the FBI algorithm does is you put the bank robber picture in and go, and when 50 different possible matches come out, this guy's jaw looks similar, this guy's eyebrow is furled in the same way, this guy's nose looks the same. 86% of the time, they're gonna find an accurate match in those 50 images uh, with that facial recognition application. So that's a form of prediction. So that means back to the centaur, the human, it's augmentation of human capacity. The human now has to go through those things and figure out, well, great draw match, but this person was, lives in Alaska and this event occurred 10 minutes ago in Ohio, et cetera. So um, that's a good example of, um, and I totally lost, oh yeah, intelligence, the uses, the national security uses of AI, intelligence, right? Think Homeland Security, think nonproliferation, anomaly detection, um, searching every bill of lading, searching the weight of maritime platforms, everything out there, to try and piece together, where's that illicit arms shipment? Who's doing the thing they're not supposed to be doing? This is a great application for uh, the kind of AI capability we have now, provided you use it to augment human judgment. Don't say, oh, here's the answer to the question. Um, and I, I worry that um, uh, a lot of national security decision makers uh, may not understand the predictive aspect of AI. And, um, and so, we're, uh, so, so here's another example which, which, where AI does immediately have military application, queuing, right? We have, we have hundreds of thousands of hours of video. Where do we have the video from? We have it from, uh, from uh, unmanned aerial vehicles, among other places, right? And so what, what the AI application can do is it can run through the 20 hours of video. So you can either have a human sit there and look at it and fall asleep and miss the key moment when the actor goes in or out or the child walks into the building and you miss it. Um, or you can have the AI identify every anomalous event on the tape, which might mean anytime there's a human that appears in the tape. And all of a sudden, instead of having the blank number of intelligence analysts, half of them sleepy and half of them bored and half of them not sure what they're doing, the algorithm can generate for you, uh, the AI can generate for you that part of the video that has human, human events in it. And now you can analyze those human events and say, what do they tell us? What do they tell us? Is this a terrorism target? Is this a military object? What does it tell us? That's a good application. It's controversial. Uh, but, but in Jamie Baker land, I'd rather have uh, accuracy in our decision making, uh, and, and then the targeting, uh, rather anything that adds to that accuracy, uh, I, I'm in favor of.
So we, only, we have a, we have just maybe two more two more minutes. So I want to end on a fun question from our audience, which is how you you talked uh, in your answer about super AI. So how close are we to Skynet from becoming a reality? And uh, Skynet is the self aware computer system from the Terminator movies. Okay, thank you for that. Um, <laughs> the uh, in in the vernacular, there's 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 lots of different terms, but but the the three we're flirting with right now is our narrow AI, and narrow AI is the AI we have now, which is capable of or not human level machine intelligence in a particular area, facial recognition. Um, artificial general intelligence is the term that's used to describe an artificial intelligence capacity that can switch from task to task. Uh, and and is, is mobile and fluid in how it does that. Super artificial intelligence, which is what all these robots, all these movies are about, is when the artificial intelligence is no longer general intelligence, but is super, and that means smarter than any human. It's already achieved human level capacity. It now goes on the internet and it scoops up all the knowledge of the internet in one second and it scoops up all the energy in the world because it's connected to the energy, uh, it, it connected to the grid. Um, and, and then it, uh, so Nick Bostrom, who's one of the AI philosophers that everybody points to, comes up with the paperclip machine, uh, the paperclip optimizer. And it's a paperclip optimizer because it's a neutral thing. Paperclip makers don't, aren't evil. Um, and it's been trained to make paper clips, but it has super intelligence. So what does it do? It goes on the internet, it connects itself to all the world's energy supply. It runs out of electrical energy, so it looks for sources of carbon, and it finds that human, humans are made of carbon, so it builds a machine to collect humans and turn them into carbon energy. Uh, when uh, Vladimir Putin went to the AI lab in Russia in 2017 and asked, when will it eat me? Uh, people laughed. Uh, I didn't laugh because it meant that um, Vladimir Putin was being briefed on AI, was being briefed on super artificial intelligence, and was reading Nick Bostrom, all of which are terrifying things. Um, but the, uh, there are three camps in this area. Camp one is uh, the sort of US government and Google and everybody else saying, knock it off, calm down, uh, this is going to all work out fine, we just have to work at it longer. The Nick Bostrom camp and the Stephen Hawking camp is, a fork in the road camp. Uh, we, we will get to a point where we might go right into evil land and we might go left into good land because there are a lot of good applications for AI and we may not know we're at the fork and that's a risk. And then there's the James Rostrom camp which has his books called The Last Invention or Our Last Invention which is sort of it's inevitable that we'll, we'll miss the point at AGI where we get to super artificial intelligence and we'll find out when we're being eaten. Um, that's hysterical, and my point is, don't worry about that. Not <laughs> partly because I don't think it'll happen, but we're going to do. We have so many opportunities to get in trouble ahead of that, to do ourselves in first. We shouldn't be worrying about that one. Worry about these, please. Worry about these. That's, um, that's the perfect ending. Um, and so I am going to turn it over to Dean Boyce to wrap things up. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Baker, for that fascinating overview of one of today's most pressing security issues. Uh, many thanks also to you, Jamie, for Jamie Wenders for conducting an insightful interview and to Judge Everett for kicking us off this morning. We also thank Judge Everett for establishing the David F. Everett Post-Conflict Reconstruction Speaker Series, which brings renowned post-conflict resolution speakers and experts to the College of Law and connects them to students in our PCR certificate program. To provide some additional context for Judge Baker's book, it arose out of a collaboration with Georgetown Center for Security and Emerging Technologies. That's a two-year, $500,000 research grant. Besides the Centaur's dilemma, the project has developed multiple reports about the policy implications of AI, including a guidebook on AI for judges and a policymaker's guide to ethics and artificial intelligence. These resources are making SPL, our Institute for Security Policy and Law, the go-to institution for presentations on AI policy and law, including at the Defense Intelligence Agency, the Government Accountability Office, the National War College, and the American Bar Association. Importantly for our students, this research is also being incorporated into our law curriculum, especially in Judge Baker's class, Emerging Technologies in Global Security, which covers AI, 
quantum computing, synthetic biology, the blockchain, and nanotechnology, giving our students the forward-leaning tech-savvy tools that they will need to practice 21st century law. Again, thank you all for joining us today. I hope we've provided you for some food for thought. And I look forward to seeing many of you throughout the day and this evening as we close our 2020 Law Alumni Weekend with our third annual Alumni of Color Awards Ceremony this evening at 5.30 p.m. I'll see you all in the Zoom rooms.